I'm here to tell you a story about um, game development um, and company development and um, developing engineers. Um, I'm going to cover about the last two years of my life where I had a great opportunity to help uh, build an online game platform and an organization at Undead Labs. Um, the talk that uh, I'm giving is about solving problems, pretty much. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I've got about 10 years under my belt of building and releasing um, online games. I've worked on Guild Wars 2, Lord of the Rings Online, Dungeons and Dragons, Terra, League of Legends, and most recently, um, Moonrise. I work at Undead Labs, which was founded in 2009 by the, one of the founders of ArenaNet, Jeff Strain. I joined in 2013. I was uh, employee 20 or so, um, and now we're up to around uh, 50 people. Um, our first flagship title was State of Decay. Uh, it launched in June 5th, 2013 on Xbox 360 uh, Live Arcade. Um, it did quite well. Uh, we were very surprised and very happy that we had so many fans. Uh, so well that we're re-releasing it on Xbox One and PC with updated graphics on April 28th. Um, and um, that'll be out uh, next month, um, or this month, actually. Um, and this original game was completed with about 20 people. It's a single-player game, so it's substantially easier to make a single-player game than it is a multiplayer game. As soon as you start making a multiplayer game, the complexity level goes up quite a bit. Um, the new game that we're working on, which is our first online title, is called Moonrise. Um, it's available on PC, Mac, iOS, and Android. Pretty much anything that we can jam the thing on. Um, and it's got great touch control and also great uh, keyboard mouse support. Originally, it was codenamed Kaiju. And the game that we set out to make was just this AAA console or PC-like experience on a mobile device. Later on, we shifted. And now, like I said, we're on PC and Mac. Um, and really, we're just trying to create this AAA competitive PvP game for anyone who wants to play. Um, and again, this is our first online experience. So when you're building online games, it's not just building the, uh, building the software that supports it, uh, building the community. Um, it's also managing it, uh, like how do you operate that? And when you're a company of 20 people that then grew to 50, you don't have the ability to publish your game yourself, or you don't have the publishing resources, and you also don't have an operations team or an internal IT team. You know, Undead wanted to stay development focused, and this is a story about how we did that. And we had to do that with something that's called no ops. Um, but no ops doesn't mean there's no operations. Um, it just means there's no dedicated operations people. We didn't have the time or the ability and bandwidth to hire an entire operations team. So this talk should cover not just how to build the game and how we got things done, but how we were able to do it without that whole part of our organization that most game com online game companies would have. So architecting, planning, and implementing is about 40% of an engineer's job. Um, this is the part that every engineer really likes. This is what they went to school for. This is the thing that got them into engineering in the first place. But the other 60% is actually team building communication. If you told me this a couple years ago, I really wouldn't have believed it. I would have thought, like, no, I know how to build the thing, and you know, I'm a pretty good engineer. I can solve my way out of anything by writing some code and staying in my editor. But you can't solve every problem with that. And actually, you can only solve about 40% of the job that you were signed up to do by doing that. Unfortunately, the engineering is like the marshmallows in your cereal. And the 60 other percent is like everything else in this bowl. And that 60 other percent is like, you know, you have to eat this really terrible meatloaf before you get your ice cream, or you, know, you, don't, get, you, know, you don't get dinner before you go to bed. Um, and this is pretty much how it is in tech. Like people really like to focus on the engineering problems uh, and, and how those were solved. But not a lot of people like to think about all the other stuff that you have to do before your organization is even capable of tackling those engineering problems. So that brings us to what our problem was. We were 20 people uh, trying to make a very ambitious online game. And how do we go about doing that? So you know, some of the goals that we had were to stay development focused. Um, we knew we needed to transition from a single player game into a multiplayer game. We wanted to make massively multiplayer online games. Um, and uh, we, needed, we weren't going to become a publishing organization, so we needed to, at the same time, build a strong, positive relationship with our publisher. Um, and while you're doing all this, by the way, you have to have a strong company culture. 
or you're going to have this hiring pipeline where people come in, then they go out, then they come in, then they go out. Um, and really what you want to do is keep people as long as you can and invest in the people, not just the software. You need to develop that company, not just the software. Um, we knew we had to hire carefully because of this. Um, you know, picking up, it's, it's, it's just like dating. You know, like, it's very important that you match with the person just as much as they match with you. And one of the things you can do to make sure you hire smart is to hire engineers, not programmers. Um, a lot of people think these are the same thing. And the, the word often gets used synonymously. But the thing is that engineers are people that solve problems. Um, there are people that you hire that you tell them this is the thing that needs to be done. And regardless of the technology stack the thing's built on, or um, the time of day that they need to do it in, um, or their, the constraints that they're given with it, either money or resources, they're going to figure out a way to solve that problem and get it done. Programmers are the guys that you can hire and say, all right, I need, a, I need this quick Rails app, or I need this quick PHP website stood up, and you know, it's just like an e-commerce site. It's a problem that's been solved many times before, and you can hire those guys to do it. But we knew that what we had to do was hire right, and we had our en hire engineers. Um, we also didn't want to overhire, so don't be afraid to contract work out. Um, and you can also contract to hire people. So like a good amount of our work that we do uh, on the art space or engineering space when we just don't have the resources, we just intelligently hand the work out uh, to uh, contractors, review the work and work with the contractors and build those relationships and maintain those as well. And when you're hiring, uh, con I'm sorry, uh, contract to hire, that's a, a tool that you can use to make sure that you never hire a maybe. When you're interviewing somebody to come and work at your organization, if you don't walk out of that interview and say, yes, this is somebody that I want to work with, and yes, this is somebody that can solve the problems that I have, I'm confident that this is one of the people I can trust. Just don't hire that person if you do not feel that way. When you're interviewing, what you want to look for is three things that I believe make up a perfect employee. You want to look for people that have a good IQ, a great EQ, and a great personality. IQ is the thing that we often look for in engineers. That's their ability to identify a problem and then come up with a solution. EQ is something that we don't often test for. That's emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is the one thing that you can actually grow through practice. Your IQ can't really raise that high from solving problems over and over. But your EQ can go from nothing. You could be somebody that doesn't even understand human emotions, and you, as long as you don't have a disability, can work with that and figure out how it is that you're supposed to talk to other humans. And then personality is huge. That's the culture fit. Like, is this person somebody that is going to be great to work with on this team? Is this somebody that I can trust, I can talk to? So <clears throat> when you're trying to stay small and you're trying to hire smart, you need to also develop smart. You need to be pragmatic about it. And you need to iterate quickly and leverage open source. Don't have not invented here syndrome. Create things when there is problems to so that you have to solve. Uh, create a thing that will be directly applied to a problem that you have to solve if nothing else exists. But try to leverage open source. There's no reason, for instance, to create your own chef. Just use chef. And with that, use the right tools and patterns. So for instance, are we building a distributed system? Um, an online game is basically a giant distributed system. Uh, and if you are, then Erlang is a great choice for that. Um, Erlang is something that we chose to use, or basically the Erlang VM, because it made sense. It's the right tool. And if you're think, talking about Erlang, then you're also talking about OTP. OTP is the framework for building those distributed systems. And this is the thing that really sells Erlang to an organization. Um, a lot of game companies will re-implement this in C++, or they'll say, oh, I have this problem. No one solved this before. Or we've, we've, seen, we've solved this at a company before, but we did it the wrong way. So let's re-implement it ourselves. But that's like, would you build your own web framework? You know, you have to build an e-commerce website today. You probably shouldn't just go build your own web framework. You should leverage the things that already exist, try to solve your problem, and then iterate later on, replace whatever it is that didn't work in your framework below. You also wouldn't make your own game engine. So we used Unity for, in, in our game. I mean, you could do these things. But you know, some of us have things that we need to do. Um, we're trying to make a game, and we're not trying to make our own game engine. And Erlang and OTP save a lot of time. So just like Rails would save you a lot of time, it's a very smart choice. But the thing is that those things are only going to save time if your team buys in. Um, so when we started, this is about two years ago, we had a language evaluation. 
Um, I was like employee 21 or so, and a friend of mine uh, was another server programmer that had been working there in contracting. Uh, we sat down together and said, all right, what is the technology that we want to use for the server backend? Uh, we had already decided that we were going to use Unity for the game client. So what technology should we adopt? We're going to look at C, C++, C Sharp, or Mono. Both of those are really good choices. Um, Python, Ruby, or Erlang. Um, one of the things that we knew we needed to do was live in the cloud. Um, and tooling in the cloud is mostly focused on Linux, uh, or it definitely was two years ago. So whatever we came up with, we were saying we definitely have to make sure that it runs on Linux. Um, and another thing is that game engineers are usually really experienced in C-like languages. So showing them Erlang, which is not object-oriented, it's functional. Um, C is not object-oriented, but showing them a functional language like Erlang um, that's not C-sharp or um, you know, it's not a Windows language is also really tough. Um, so one of the things that we decided early on was that Mono would be a good choice uh, potentially for some of our servers, especially since Mono is leveraged heavily inside Unity. The other thing that we looked at was Erlang, and we looked and said, what are the perks for network programming? You know, with Erlang, you could do things like easily encode and decode binary messages. You could also subscribe or monitor to open sockets, which is like really huge and free that you get that for free. Um, you also get free internal, uh, free routing of internal messages. Any Erlang term can be routed to another Erlang node really easily without a whole lot of work that you need to do. Again. OTP and the Erlang VM just give it at free. And you have a sane threading model that's also crash resistant. So the problem with this, though, is that um, Erlang isn't very approachable. Um, and um, I already had known Erlang. I, I began learning in 2009. I read a book, um, the, uh, the Programming Erlang by Joe Armstrong. And I had read it because I was working on a game that they were re-implementing OTP and Erlang in C++. And a coworker of mine said, hey, did you ever hear of Erlang? I said, no. And he told me, basically, what you're doing is Erlang. And I had no idea. So I read the book, and then I came back to work the next day. And I said, hey, did you guys ever hear of Erlang? And he said, absolutely. We were very influenced by Erlang. And that is why we decided to rewrite it in C++. <laughs> <laughs> I said, it's a very unusual choice. Uh, why would you rewrite that in C++? And they said, because nobody knows Erlang. And this was eight years ago or six years ago, something like that. So, um, that discussion that I had with that person, they sense do not think like that anymore. But I learned something that day, which was, if it's not approachable and it doesn't look like it's a good idea, it doesn't matter how good it is underneath. It doesn't matter if there's a gold mine under this thing, no one's going to look at it because it's just not approachable. So Erlang and OTP, we knew it was going to save us time, and we knew that if we could get buy-in on our team, we would be successful in developing our applications with it. So what we did is we looked at something called Elixir. Elixir is a pr programming language that's built on the Erlang VM. Uh, it provides you with some additional things that basically create a language that's very extensible, very easy to use, it has great tooling, um, it has hygienic macros. I like to describe Elixir as being one part Ruby, one part Clojure, and another very core part being Erlang. Um, it doesn't have Ruby syntax, but it has something that looks very similar to Ruby syntax, and it's very easy to understand what's going on. Uh, it has hygienic macros and a great build system um, that's based on basically Clojure uh, or Clojure's build tool lining in. Uh, and then it's at the core, it's Erlang. Um, and Elixir has the same core concepts. Even though it's approachable, it still has processes, mailboxes, supervision trees, pattern matching, tail recursion. These are the things that when you read an Erlang book or an Elixir book, you should be co focusing on learning. These are the hard things to learn. Um, it shouldn't be syntax. So we started using Elixir at 090. It's at 10 now. Um, and uh, we went through a number of revisions. But when we looked at it, we said, is this a risk? Uh, we're adopting a language that's not done. Um, and we're doing it because it's approachable. Is this a risk? Uh, and it was really quick to answer that. Um, it has the best interop I've ever seen with its base language. So speaking Erlang to Elixir and Elixir to Erlang is really, really easy. And that was the risk mitigator that we needed. We knew that no matter what, we could switch to Erlang and just call the Elixir code that we had written um, if the language is dead after a couple years. So, you know, you're able to leverage with Elixir all the Erlang tooling and libraries for free because of that interoperability, and that's absolutely what we wanted. So, syntax really doesn't matter, especially if you already know the syntax. Uh, when you look at Erlang, I don't know 
who in the room has ever seen it, but it looks like prologue and you have to end every statement with a period or a semicolon. It's really unusual for um, new programmers that haven't seen something like that before. And a lot of Erlang people are saying syntax doesn't matter. But the problem with that is that it does. It doesn't matter to you because you already know it. But it does matter when you're trying to show something to somebody else. Elixir syntax makes Erlang's ecosystem way more approachable for your colleagues. That's what you need to do. You need to have compassion when you're coming up with technology that you're trying to advocate to other people. So I know that Erlang's great, and I show it to somebody else, and then they're like, oh, I can't approach it. You need to have compassion and understand why they're having that response. And if you can think about it, and you bring them look like Elixir or something that's very similar, your, the response from them might be quite different. So tooling is super important, too. If you're ever to create an Erlang project, there's a number of things that you have to do before you can. This is before Concrete existed. Concrete's nice and Rebar's nice, but Elixir has Mix. A Mix is a build tool that ships with a language that allows you to generate a brand new, pro new project at the push of a button. It also has a great package manager um, and a dependency resolver that reaches into the package manager. Um, it's a true modern language, just like Go or Rust. Um, so that was our language evaluation, our tech evaluation. That's how we landed on what we were going to use to build our platform and our game servers. But after we went through that, there was another discussion that had to, be, had to have happened, which is how are we going to run this? Like, we're only 20 people right now, or 22 people. We don't have an operations team. What are we going to do to, once this thing's in flight, keep it running? And one of the things we established really early on was that we needed to live in the cloud. Living in the cloud means that we could make on-demand test environments. We could expand or contract our live environment during uh, times a day when we needed less population or more. Uh, we had a lower or, or a higher population. Um, and it allowed us to iterate really quickly. Um, so we said, well, we can't have, we can't have an operations team. Um, we need to live in the cloud, so who's going to configure our machines? And everybody here probably knows that we wanted to use Chef. Um, Chef is another technology that um, is much more approachable today than it was a number of years ago. Um, but when you're coming to an organization and no one knows how to use Chef, you need to be prepared to evangelize for it as well, just like we, we needed to with Elixir or, or even Mono. Um, and uh, when we're using Chef, we made a very special uh, choice that application engineers were going to own the cookbook for their applications and that every application was going to have its own cookbook. We weren't going to hire a team of people that was managing the cookbooks for uh, the engineers or hire one guy that was going to write all of the cookbooks. We made it clear that if you're an application engineer or you're a server programmer and you're deploying code somewhere, you're the one writing those cookbooks. We also made it very clear that all applications are de developed and designed with automatic discovery in mind. Um, no one's got time when you have a thousand machines to open up a flat JSON file and in input IP addresses like 100 times over to configure an environment. So one of the tools that we use for that is console. Console, uh, when we first started using it, uh, was at 010. Uh, we adopted it really, really early on. And even since 010, it's been rock solid for us. This is a great choice. Console is uh, used for service discovery in our environment, and it's also used for leader election. Um, we have something called a match server. That's the thing that will match make players together, and there can only be one of them in a particular region. And the match servers need to have the ability to fall over, and somebody needs to pick up the reins if one of them fails. So we use console to do leader election between those. And we also use console with something that we wrote called discovery. Uh, we also open source this. Discovery is used to automatically discover and connect Erlang nodes. Typically, Erlang nodes, when they connect to each other, are fully meshed. The problem with fully meshed nodes is that as you get over 100 machines, the connections are completely intertwined, like a giant spider web. Uh, and it's really hard to get past 100 nodes. So what we do instead is we use discovery to create these gateway nodes that other applications connect into. And they don't broadcast their presence to all the other servers. So for example, we have, say, 10 routing servers. All the routing servers know about each other. But the chat servers who connect to the uh, console and then broadcast themselves out to the routing servers get picked up and then the chat servers don't know about each other. Whenever they want to send a message to each other, they bounce the messages off of a routing server. And that's how we um, solve the problem of fully meshed Erlang networks. Discovery is broken into some parts here. It has a polar. Uh, a pol it, the polar fires events when it finds a thing that it's looking for. 
So for instance, a chat server will be looking for a routing server that it needs to connect to. As soon as it finds one, it fires this event. Handlers, which handle the events that the polar's fired off, and then it has a heartbeat which says, I'm here. So for instance, the routing servers broadcast a heartbeat while the chat servers look for that heartbeat to connect to them. And this is, um, might be confusing for people that don't know Elixir, but um, Discovery is written in Elixir, and this is actually what it looks like to start a polar that has um, a, uh, uh, an event handler for when a node is connected. Um, so specifically here this says, I'm gonna look for routing servers, and then I'm gonna connect to the routing server. Uh, I'm gonna run a route connector when I, run to the, when I connect to a routing server. So that's configuring machines and auto-discovery. Um, that's only half the battle. We also need to make those machines. So you could sit there in the EC2 in interface and click through and hand create everything. And you could click through and hand create VPCs and subnets and there's a lot of different artifacts in EC2 once you get into it. Or you could just use Terraform. Um, Terraform is another product by, Hash by HashiCorp, the guys that brought Vagrant and Console to us. Terraform's at a very good spot right now. Um, it came out maybe a year and a half ago, and I looked at it, and we couldn't use it for our infrastructure. But it's at 0.3.7 now, uh, and we use it to describe our infrastructure uh, almost exclusively at this point. You can create uh, instances, uh, security groups, subnets, VPCs. You can do almost everything, I'm sorry, you can do everything you can with the um, AWS console, but you can do it in a programmatic way. So Terraform's uh, basically an abstraction for a cloud provider. Um, it allows you, again, to describe all those EC2 artifacts that we just mentioned. And another thing that we decided, along with application engineers owning their cookbooks, is that they'd own and maintain their Terraform module as well. Um, Terraform is modular, so uh, it allows you to say, uh, for instance, this is for our platform server. Um, I want a new platform server, or I want a new cluster of platform servers. And these are configurable attributes that we allow you to have. So for instance, I created the platform or the cookbook and the module for it, and then I expose this to the other engineers, and it says, how many route servers do you want, how many app server instances do you want, and how many replication servers do you want? And with this, they would configure it, pull the module in, run Terraform apply, it'll create the instance for them, and then because we use console to auto-discover with everything, um, the nodes will just automatically figure each other out, have an election about who owns whatever shards uh, in, the shard data, in the data sharding that we have, and the uh, whole platform will just come up with a click of a button, basically. So you use Terraform to describe and provision environments, and you use Chef to describe and configure your nodes. Um, both of these tools could have a talk of their own, um, so I highly recommend that you spend some time with each of these in your own time. Um, so because applications engineers are owning all this, it was very clear to us that there's no such thing as a DevOps team at Undead. Uh, I've said this in almost every slide, every talk I've given at ChefConf, uh, but it's worth repeating, is that every engineer needs to understand the languages that we're building these things in, Elixir, C Sharp, and they also need to understand the tooling that we're using in the cloud, and they need to understand Chef to configure those nodes because no one's gonna do it for them. This is one of the reasons that you wanted to hire the right people. Um, you need to hire engineers, people that were ready to understand these things and, and participate in the whole tool chain. Um, so after you choose these languages and technology stacks, that's not enough. You need to foster adoption for these technology choices. Um, it's really important that you make on-ramps for your teammates. And it's also really important to create an environment which is safe to fail in. Um, create and evangelize patterns and then allow collaboration with people. You need to turn your colleagues into ambassadors for the technology that you evangelize to them in the first place. Continue to help them until they are. And one of the things that you can do to get them there is providing helpful code reviews. Assist them, this, a code reviews assist people with learning. And it's very important that you keep a positive tone in these code reviews. Don't, don't concentrate on syntax, where the period goes, how many spacing there is, if a license header is present or not, and definitely stay away from disparaging comments about other technologies, because when you're trying to evangelize a new technology to somebody, those are things that turn them off. They're not really interested in hearing about it. And then 
make DevOps part of your culture. It allows you to protect your culture in a way by fully embracing DevOps because you hired engineers, they're all empowered, they're all aware of the technology that they're using. And by embracing this technology, I'm sorry, this pattern, you can control your live service. You don't become beholden to a service organization that's controlling when deployments happen. If you created some new functionality for a player and you're ready to send it out to the player, you can do it. But you're the person that's going to get called about it when you wake up in, uh, and be woken up in the middle of the night. So be prepared for that. But you're not putting your problems on somebody else. And this also allows us, again, to operate with a lower headcount. So let's quickly look at uh, a high-level overview of uh, Moonrise's architecture. Um, or pretty much any online game. Uh, online games are typically broken up into three parts. There's a game client, a uh, game server or servers, and then there's a service platform underneath it all. Um, game servers simulate the game, and they negotiate with clients, and they also communicate with the service platform. The game client is pretty easy. It connects to these game servers, uh, and that's the thing that renders at 30 or 60 frames per second and it's the thing that you're playing. It's the executable that you run in your machine, the exe or the .app file. And then the platform is the thing behind all that. It's game agnostic, typically. A great platform is game agnostic. It's highly available. So at any time of day, players can connect or game servers can connect and uh, pull, or pull game data out or authenticate users. Um, it's the stitching around the game experience. So when you log into a game, you think like, oh, I'm connected to a server. You hear it often in online games. It's like, oh, the, the hamster stopped running in the wheel. I guess that's why the servers are off. That's just not how it works. You're really connected to one thing with a persistent connection, and that is routing messages through a distributed network of other services. Other services like authentication, chat, presence, leaderboards, guilds, player profiles, you name it. Um, if you want to buy something in the game, um, typically what's going to happen is, you're going to message a game server. The game server is then going to message a routing server. The routing server is going to message a fulfillment server who goes out and val verifies that you're purchasing the thing that you did and then fulfill the purchase by sending you an asynchronous message that then the game server picks up and then provisions you the items that you were going to get. Much more difficult to explain than, oh, you're connected to one server and it all runs there. Platform is also similar to something called like Battle.net if you've ever played on uh, Blizzard games. Um, so with the three parts that we have, we knew that we needed to have at least three application. We needed to have at least two application cookbooks. Um, we needed to have one for our platform, which we named Tubes. Um, that's the thing that provides the services to everything. Um, and each recipe has a uh, um, sorry. The cookbook has a recipe for each service. So there's an auth recipe, um, there's a chat recipe, and so on. And then there's um, the Daemon cookbook, which is actually Moonrise's other code name. Um, and that is for game servers, so um, a couple different game server types that we have, World and Combat, and that'll set those up. And then we have an Undead Labs base cookbook, which both of these inherit from. Um, the Undead Labs base cookbook's job is to set up machines in a way like put all the users on it, configure any special firewall rules that we have common on everything, um, or uh, basically any common functionality that you want on all of your machines. And then we have the ability to describe environments with Terraform. Um, and what we do is we create a cloud environment repo on GitHub. And when you clone that out to your uh, desktop, um, you have one directory per environment. And then Terraform has this thing called state. Um, so when you run Terraform, it writes files out to disk that represent the thing that just happened. So if I created a new instance, and uh, I'm sorry, if I created a new cluster and I had eight, 10 instances, some VPCs and subnets, this state file would get written to my disk. And then when I ran Terraform again at another time to manipulate it by either adding or removing an instance, we look at that state file and make sure that the cloud looks the way that it is. This is important to know because if it's only on my machine and I have somebody else run Terraform apply, they're going to either bust over my environment or it's just not going to go well. So what we can do is we can store that state in a remote provider. And Terraform allows us to do that with Atlas or console. Atlas is uh, HashiCorp's basically a culmination of all their tools together. And then console, we already talked about. So you just go clone it from GitHub, go into the cloud environments, and then we have 
one environment called Moonrise JW Test. And then there's a single file on there called default that contains the description of what our environment that we're creating for my test environment is. And this is a small subset of it. Um, this says that I'm pulling in the uh, Undead Labs module. Um, the, uh, again, this is, like I said, Terraform is modular, so if I create a module, I can uh, place it on GitHub or in a cookbook somewhere else. And then, basically, the Undead Labs module is going to do the job of setting up the VPC for me. Uh, I'm sorry, setting up uh, the uh, subnets and VPCs for me. Um, we have the tubes module, which is for the tubes cookbook. Um, and uh, then we're also sitting, uh, saying that we're putting this all in the uh, Moonrise VPC uh, with a particular subnet that allows the machines to talk to each other. And once we have that, we run Terraform get. It pulls down the modules. Um, we make sure we had set the remote backend to console. Um, and then we run Terraform apply. And then once we do that, we commit everything that we had, any changes that we had made to the environment, and push them up to GitHub, so that way another engineer can pull it down and make changes they need, run Terraform, apply again, and uh, update that cluster. Um, here's some resources for you to learn how Terraform works. That first link is actually really powerful. Um, it tells you how, basically, you can completely leverage um, AWS or EC2 with Terraform. Um, and then the next one is uh, Terraform's documentation. That's a pretty great picture, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and here's my contact information. Um, so we have about three minutes or so, I think, for uh, questions. Does anyone have a question? Yeah, and if you have a question, let me run the mic over to you. So with no central ops team, who manages the base cookbooks? Great question. What he said is, with no central ops team, who manages the base cookbooks? All the engineers manage the base cookbooks. So whenever you're doing a thing to the base cookbook, it's to add some sort of value or some sort of security to your overall environment. And what we do is we communicate with the other engineers who are consumers of that cookbook and we tell them about it, and we say, this is what our thinking is. This is probably why we need to do this. And they normally just say, all right, shut up. Tell, yeah, fine. Uh, and then you make a pull request on GitHub. You CC them, make sure they review it. And then you cut a new release, and you tell everybody, hey, there's a new release of the Undead Labs base cookbook. You should make sure you update to it, because that thing we discussed that was important, you'll get it if you update your cookbook to the Undead Labs base cookbook. So you talked a lot about the back end, this, this, the game server and the infrastructure in AWS. What about the client and that you're using Unity to connect to the game server? And if the game client crashes and things like that, how do you manage recovery or you don't? You just restart a whole new session and you don't persist anything? And what happens if there was a, some type of fulfillment that's on the server side and it crashed? Like how do you manage that yeah. sort of operation? So I think the mic actually, I don't need to repeat the questions because the mic should be getting them, right? But uh, that's true. Can I get a thumbs up? All right. Um, so when we want to, uh, so basically, I, I, yeah, I didn't talk a lot about the client because I only had 35 minutes. So I tried to put as much as I could in here um, about what I thought was most important about the last two years of my life. But the client's actually really neat, and Unity is super powerful. Um, the client has state reported to it from the game server, and the game servers are authoritative about that state. That's the negotiating with clients. The client says, I did this, and then the server's like, eh, maybe you did, and it checks what everybody else says, and then it's like, okay, you did, and then it reports the messages out to everybody else. So the game client crashes. Um, typically, it's not a hard crash. Uh, if it is, you go back to desktop, you got to log back in. Um, but if you have a soft crash or a network part problem, like you're going through a tunnel on your bus, because uh, the game, by the way, you, you're playing against PC players on your iOS device. If that happens, it asks you to reconnect and because the platform saved all your state and the game server knew you disconnected, it persisted it all into the platform. And then when you log back in, it all comes back. So it works really well, actually. Um, yeah, it kind of works like Erlang does, 
by persisting state somewhere else, and when your process crashes, you just pull it back in. Yeah. All right, so perhaps one last question, if anybody. How's it going, Doug? Hey, so uh, from the chef standpoint, are you using like um, are you using per cookbook environments? So like for every app cookbook, you have dev test and prod or whatever. Yeah. So last year, I gave a chat that covered something called the environment cookbook pattern. Um, none of that's changed. I still use all that. Um, and one cookbook per application that gets locked to an environment in Chef. Chef has these environment files that can be rep that could also represent a logical environment. Logical environments are like EU West Live or something like that, right? So we have Tubes, which is the platform EU West Live, or Moonrise Tubes EU West Live because we have more than one game that we're working on. And then we'll have, you know, Daemon EU West Live. Uh, and that represents those environments for um, those cookbooks. And the Burks file lock gets applied to the environments, which then ensures that the version that we said the thing is, is exactly correct from the test environments to the production environments. Um, I wrote a blog post about it, and I also um, uh, had a talk last year at ChefConf that covers it pretty well. I could also, if anyone wants to ask me about that afterwards, I can tell you all about it. Awesome. Well, huge thank you to Jamie for participating in ChefConf again this year.